chance to fish pretty much all over the state of Florida, primarily though, shallow water on the east coast in a, in a, shallow, a shallow lagoon called Mosquito Lagoon. And for those of you who have had a chance to travel to Florida, you know how difficult it would be to fish. The water is clear, the pressure is really high, there are boats everywhere, and the fish limits are quite a bit different. So when I got here to Savannah, I got a chance to uh, fish a little bit different water. And the techniques that I had grown up with and used in Florida, I had to adapt to the way the water is today. So Robert, I thought we'd talk to you a little bit about what it meant to use live bait in the shallow water fishing here in Savannah. And then how do we use artificials? Because as you all know, there's a time frame when you can access live bait, and then there's a time when you cannot or if you do not want to have uh, shrimp and crabs and fish scales all over your hands, how to use artificial baits. So I think we'll go that direction tonight. He, he's absolutely a live bait expert. I would throw that out there. So I'll, I'll let you run with that one, Robert. <laughs> okay. Um, the live bait, uh, a couple options. Catch it yourself, buy it from somebody else. Um, I will, in the summertime, late summertime, I'll look at the tide and if I've got an outgoing tide or an incoming tide, the, the early part of the incoming tide and the early part of the outgoing tide, the, and I'm talking about casting for shrimp now, the shrimp will be moving from the deeper water up into the marsh. And when the tide starts going out, they'll start coming out of the marsh and moving back to the deeper water. And that's all a survival instinct, instinct in, in feeding. Um, you know, they're, they're going up in the marsh to get food and they're trying to stay away from predators. Um, so late summer, usually anytime mid-July, once the water gets really warm, um, I'll, I'll look at the tide charts and I'll head down to Delagall with a cast net and I'll work the docks. Um, so that, that first finger dock that, that runs from the boardwalk if it's, an, if it's a, the first part of the incoming tide, that tide is just starting to come up underneath the dock there. All along there is really great. Um, you do, I say this with any, any type of fishing or casting, it's probably worth your while to go find the largest high tide and the opposite of that high tide, the low tide, go down to those places where you're gonna throw your cast net. Because there is a lot of structure down there that you'll lose your cast net if you don't. So if you know where the pylons are, it always helps before you go start throwing your cast net up underneath there. But um, get your bait, and usually within 15 or 20 minutes, you can have enough bait to fish for two, two, three hours. Um, just get a bubbler on a uh, five gallon bucket, and I'll put it in the back of the truck, and I'll go hit my favorite lagoons. If I'm not gonna fish shrimp, or if I, if I don't have time or don't, want to deal with the hassle of going to cast shrimp, I'll go over the bridge to Bandy's and buy some, or I'll, you know, sometimes the uh, Landings Harbor has bait. You go down there and buy a pint, you don't have to buy a quart, um, and to get your bait to start with. Now the other options are, that I will fish with here, are fiddler crabs and um, mud minnows and finger mullet pinfish. And, there just doesn't seem to be a time that you can't go and catch finger mullet in the lagoons at some point during the day. Um, they, they're all, they always seem to be cruising. I mean, the one thing about the lagoons that, that I say over and over again is they're all there. They're not going anywhere. They're just they're swimming around in a circle in the lagoon. And that goes for the bait and the, um, and the, the, the target fish that you're after, whether it be flounder, trout, bass, um, largemouth. Uh, whatever it happens to be, they're, they're all doing the same thing. They're, they're just kind of, if they're in their feeding feeding times, they're, they're working the banks, the, the, the center sections aren't usually that big an area for fishing. It kind of depends if the water's moving. Um, as far as live bait goes, there's not a time when that usually isn't a good bait. I mean, if you've got a lot of bait, you usually can catch something. At some point, it's usually not a problem. Um, I think the most important tool that you can have for fishing in the, in the landings property is, is a lagoon guide. And the reason that I say that is because the lagoon guide has all the uh, egress points of the, the culverts 
So you can see how the water flows from one lagoon to the next. Um, basically, the lagoons were designed to take water from the center of the island to the outer banks of the, of the islands and then out into the marsh. So essentially your center, your center lagoons are typically your freshwater lagoons. As they move closer to the coast, they, they become brackish and then, you know, for the most part, saltwater. I've stood on the same bank and caught a largemouth bass and a redfish, two casts. I mean, so there is parts of the water where they'll, they'll be in the same ponds. And, they're, and that wasn't a long, single long pond, that was just a small pond in, a, in, a, in an area off of Oak Ridge that, you know, just it had flow from one, you know, through the pipes. You can see in your lagoon guys how the, the pipes connect the lagoons. And those, those fish will use those, those pipes to get from one lagoon to the next. They're just looking for food and that's all they're doing. Yeah, I'll jump in here with the artificials. <clears throat> but Robert uh, brought up an interesting point. He mentioned mullet, mud minnows, shrimp, crabs of various different sorts. So from an artificial perspective, the saying is match the hatch. It's really more for those of you that fish in freshwater and have fished in the upper Midwest and out towards California, as far as California, you fished with flies, right? Those things that match the floating insects on the surface. The same thing applies for saltwater and certainly inside shallow water estuaries and lagoons here at the landings. It's match the hatch. So what kind of artificial baits would you use to resemble, let's say, finger mullet? Well, hard baits, as simple as that sounds. Bigger, plastic, noisy. Baits, they resemble a mullet, right? But there are only certain times of the year, in, in my opinion, that this would be an appropriate bait. Number one, if the mullet are in, and they're very seasonal. There, there will be mullet around in the wintertime too, and they, and they hide out, but during a seasonal session, when the mullet are around and they're active, match the hatch, right? So if you were to go down into the, the crab stage, or even the small shrimp like Robert described, spoons, another small, tiny hard bait, something that matches a crab. I've got some plastic baits here that resemble the color of a crab, and if fish the same way, like a spoon, or like I like to do, combine the two, they look a lot like a crab. And so they'll match that hatch. On the shrimp side, really simple. You have a lot of different options that you can fish with. Typically, you won't see shrimp bouncing on the surface across a lagoon. You'll see them moving. They're down in the water column. Sometimes they're hovering on the bottom. So a bait that might resemble a shrimp could come in a lot of different sizes, colors, and textures, but I'll fish it with a tiny weighted hook. Now, this isn't a big, a big bait, right? It resembles a shrimp. It's about the same size. There's no reason a fish could see this and see a shrimp and not think that's something I might want to attack or eat. So for me, again, it's about matching the hatch. But th the thing I struggle with the most from, from an artificial standpoint is it's easy for me, like Robert said, if I have live bait to catch fish. I'm a challenge guy. If I can find a challenge in fishing, that's the route I wanna go. So I study it, I try my best to understand the different components of artificial bait fishing and, but more importantly to me, it's the availability of the live bait. I mentioned a few minutes ago that the, that the mullet come in season. Well, the same, like Robert described, I, I grew up in Florida and I had a chance to fish pretty much all over the state of Florida. Primarily though, shallow water on the East Coast in a, in a, shallow, a shallow lagoon called Mosquito Lagoon. And for those of you who have had a chance to travel to Florida, you know how difficult it would be to fish. The water is clear pressure is really high, there are boats everywhere, and the fish limits are quite a bit different. So when I got here to Savannah, I got a chance to uh, fish a little bit different water, and the techniques that I had grown up with and used in Florida, I had to adapt to the way the water is today. So Robert and I thought we'd talk to you a little bit about what it meant to use live bait in the shallow water fishing here in Savannah, and then how do we use artificials? Because as you all know, there's a time frame when you can access live bait and then there's a time when you cannot, or if you do not want to have uh, shrimp and crabs and fish scales all over your hands, how to use artificial baits. So I think we'll go that direction tonight. He, he's absolutely a live bait expert. I would throw that out there. So I'll, I'll let you run with that one, Robert. 
Okay. Um, the live bait, uh, a couple options. Catch it yourself, buy it from somebody else. Um, I will, in the summertime, late summertime, I'll look at the tide, and if I've got an outgoing tide or an incoming tide, the, the early part of the incoming tide and the early part of the outgoing tide, the and I'm talking about casting for shrimp now, the shrimp will be moving from the deeper water up into the marsh, and when the tide starts going out, they'll start coming out of the marsh and moving back to the deeper water. And that's all a survival instinct, instinct in, in feeding. Um, you know, they're, they're going up in the marsh to get food and they're trying to stay away from predators. Um, so late summer, usually anytime mid-July, once the water gets really warm, um, I'll, I'll look at the tide charts and I'll head down to Delegal with a cast net and I'll work the docks. Um, so that, that first finger dock that, that runs from the boardwalk, if it's, an, if it's a, the first part of the incoming tide, that tide is just starting to come up underneath the dock there. All along there is really great. Um, you do, I say this with any, any type of fishing or casting, it's probably worth your while to go find the largest high tide and the opposite of that high tide, the low tide, go down to those places where you're gonna throw your cast net. Because there is a lot of structure down there that you'll lose your cast net if you don't. So if you know where the pylons are, it always helps before you go start throwing your cast net up underneath there. But um, get your bait, and usually within 15 or 20 minutes, you can have enough bait to fish for two, two, three hours. Um, just get a bubbler on a uh, five gallon bucket, and I'll put it in the back of the truck, and I'll go hit my favorite lagoons. And if I'm not gonna fish shrimp, or if I, if I don't have time or don't wanna deal with the hassle of going to cast shrimp, I'll go over the bridge to Bandy's and buy some, or I'll, you know, sometimes the uh, Landy's Harbor has bait. You go down there and buy a pint, you don't have to buy a quart, um, and to get your bait to start with. Now the other options are, that I will fish with here, are fiddler crabs, and um, mud minnows, and finger mullet pinfish. And there just doesn't seem to be a time that you can't go and catch finger mullet in the lagoons at some point during the day. Um, they, they're all, they always seem to be cruising. I mean, the one thing about the lagoons that, that I say over and over again is, they're all there, they're not going anywhere. They're just, they're swimming around in a circle in the lagoon. And that goes for the bait and the, um, and the, the, the target fish that you're after, whether it be flounder, trout, bass, um, largemouth, uh, whatever it happens to be. They're, they're all doing the same thing. They're, they're just kind of, if they're in their feeding feeding times, they're, they're working the banks, the, the, the center sections aren't usually that big an area for fishing. It kind of depends if the water's moving. Um, as far as live bait goes, there's not a time when that usually isn't a good bait. I mean, if you've got a lot of bait, you usually can catch something. At some point, it's usually not a problem. Um, I think the most important tool that you can have for fishing in the, in the landings property is, is a lagoon guide. And the reason that I say that is because the lagoon guide has all the uh, egress points of the, the culverts so you can see how the water flows from one lagoon to the next. Um, basically, the lagoons were designed to take water from the center of the island to the outer banks of the, of the islands and then out into the marsh. So essentially, your center, your center lagoons are typically your freshwater lagoons. As they move closer to the coast, they, they become brackish and then, you know, for the most part, salt water. I've stood on the same bank and caught a largemouth bass and a redfish, two casts. I mean, so there is parts of the water where they'll, they'll be in the same ponds. And, they're, and that wasn't a long, single long pond, that was just a small pond in, a, in, a, in an area off of Oak Ridge that, you know, just it had flow from one, you know, through the pipes. You can see in your lagoon guys how the, the pipes connect the lagoons. And those, those fish will use those, those pipes to get from one lagoon to the next. They're just looking for food, and that's all they're doing. Yeah, I'll jump in here with the artificials. 
But Robert uh, brought up an interesting point. He mentioned mullet, mud minnows, shrimp, crabs of various different sorts. So from an artificial perspective, the saying is match the hatch. It's really more for those of you that fish in freshwater and have fished in the upper Midwest and out towards California, as far as California, you fished with flies, right? Those things that match the floating insects on the surface. The same thing applies for saltwater and certainly inside shallow water estuaries and lagoons here at the landings. It's match the hatch. So what kind of artificial baits would you use to resemble, let's say, finger mullet? Well, hard baits, as simple as that sounds. Bigger, plastic, noisy baits, they resemble a mullet, right? But there are only certain times of the year, in, in my opinion, that this would be an appropriate bait. Number one, if the mullet are in, and they're very seasonal. There, there will be mullet around in the wintertime too, and they, and they hide out, but during a seasonal session, when the mullet are around and they're active, match the hatch, right? So if you were to go down into the, the crab stage or even the small shrimp like Robert described, spoons, another small, tiny hard bait, something that matches a crab. I've got some plastic baits here that resemble the color of a crab and they fish the same way like a spoon or like I like to do, combine the two, they look a lot like a crab. And so they'll match that hatch. On the shrimp side, really simple. You have a lot of different options that you can fish with. Typically, you won't see shrimp bouncing on the surface across a lagoon. You'll see them moving. They're down in the water column. Sometimes they're hovering on the bottom. So a bait that might resemble a shrimp could come in a lot of different sizes, colors, and textures, but I'll fish it with a tiny weighted hook. Now, this isn't a big, a big bait, right? It resembles a shrimp. It's about the same size. There's no reason a fish could see this and see a shrimp and not think that's something I might want to attack or eat. So for me, again, it's about matching the hatch. But th the thing I struggle with the most from, from an artificial standpoint is it's easy for me, like Robert said, if I have live bait to catch fish. I'm a challenge guy. If I can find a challenge in fishing, that's the route I want to go. So I study it. I try my best to understand the different components of artificial bait fishing. And, but more importantly to me, it's the availability of the live bait. I mentioned a few minutes ago that the, that the mullet come in season. Well, the same like Robert described with the shrimp. So what do you do when those things aren't available? You have to resort to either one, sitting on your couch and not fishing, which is not gonna happen for me, or two, go the artificial route and find something that I can do to resemble the bait fish that I think the fish would eat at the time. There are several different important features for me from an artificial standpoint color, size, and texture of the baits. This hard bait that I mentioned, funny different colors on this one, didn't really matter. It's the noise and the size and the texture of this bait that attracts fish to it. The one that I mentioned that resembles a shrimp or the soft bait that re resembles a crab. Texture is important for these baits. These are soft, they're slow moving, they're not to resemble some giant maneuver inside the water. They're very subtle. So when fish are not as active, as an example, these baits tend to catch more fish, at least in my opinion, they do. Something else about artificial bait fishing is water columns. I think most people who fish understand what that means, either on the surface, somewhere suspended, or all the way down on the bottom. For those that have toured around looking at the lagoons and seen some of those fish that you can't seem to bite, you know exactly what they're doing. They're either on the bottom, they're sitting there suspended, or some might be active on the surface. Selecting a bait that resembles what those fish are doing is also going to help you catch a few more fish. There's no reason a fish would be swimming on the surface and actively feeding, and you'd want to fish on the bottom. If he's near the surface and he's active, that's where you want to fish. So finding a bait that would float in that case, critically important. Not so much as the color, if the fish is near the surface as, the, as, as much as it is the activity. When the fish are near the bottom, got another creative bait for those that want to come by here afterwards and check it out. It's a spinner bait. For you freshwater fishermen, you know what that is, right? The one for saltwater looks a little bit different. It has the texture of the soft bait. It has a flash of a hard bait that looks like a spoon and it resembles a crab. Clicking noise, it has the noise of a hard bait. It's got all of those combinations. And until, 
I'd say maybe 10, 10, 12 years ago when I went to New Orleans to start fishing there, I realized what this bait was and what it does in salt water. And it has a major impact on the amount of fish you can catch because it resembles all of those different categories. You can fish it on the surface, you can fish it suspended, you can fish it on the bottom, it's soft, it's hard, it makes noise, it's small and subtle, pretty versatile bait. I don't know if any of that helps at this point right now too. Okay, um, the live bait, I usually use, I don't, I'm, you'll find some people that'll take a, a leader, a jig head, and put a live shrimp or a mullet or crab on it and throw it out and that's, that's sitting on the bottom. Um, I prefer to fish under a cork. Um, so you have a couple options when it comes to corks. You have adjustable, which means that you can, you can adjust the depth that the bait is suspended at, or you can go with a fixed leader uh, cork where you just uh, tie on a leader that's usually 16 to 24 inches long. And uh, that's, that's the depth that you're gonna fish at. So for our lagoons, I would say 90% of the time, a fixed leader bobber uh, pop and cork would work fine. Our lagoons are basically, and at the deepest parts are typically six to eight feet deep. And they come up, you know, pretty quickly to, uh, to the edge. So you know, a couple of feet off the bank, you're, you're in 16 to 20, 28, 36 inches of water. It's not real deep. So that fixed level cork uh, is, is perfect for that. Now, I, I fish in the rivers a lot, so that's why I use the adjustable depth because I could be fishing uh, one minute in two feet of water and then change locations and need to fish 12 or 14 feet deep. And that's where the adjustable cork comes in. You don't have to change uh, rigs when you use the adjustable. So I can use this in the landings and then if I decide to go fish the jetties um, out of the Savannah River and I need to fish 13, 12, 13 feet deep, it's just adjusting the uh, stopper on my line. So that's, that's the easiest way to do that. Um, on the saltwater side, I, I oftentimes uh, pick my days to fish. And usually what I'm looking for is a day where you know, our tide cycle is over, you know, right in, over seven and a half feet, anywhere over seven and a half feet, usually means that water is gonna be coming in uh, to the lagoon from the, uh, the marsh area. So you get those eight foot tides, you, you, I'm sure you've driven around and you've seen the lagoons where the water's rushing in. All right, that, that's just the, the tidal pressure has, has moved up the lagoon to where that it's replenishing the water. But the one thing you have to remember about these fish is that they're, they're very tide sensitive. They, they typically will not feed during an ebb tide or you know, at the very top of the high or the very bottom of the low. There's no water movement. They're just, they're usually just hanging out. They're not doing anything. Nobody's chasing them. They're not worried about um, hiding as much and they're not that, they're not in that feeding cycle. So when you, when you see that eight foot tide, so anywhere, usually within an hour, depending on the wind, to an hour and a half before that tide, and then as much as two hours after that tide, you'll have water movement either into the lagoon or out of the lagoon. And that's stirring up a lot of nutrients. I think it, it attracts the bait. And then when any, anytime there's a lot of bait around, the predator fish show up. And that's typically what we're going to fish for, your bass, your flounder, your trout. Um, the flounder are typically gonna be on the bottom. And if you're targeting those, you know, you're gonna be <coughs> Uh, in the in the bottom part of the water column, you know, they're they're all their eyes are on top of their head. They're they're always looking up to eat. So, you know, if you're focusing on flounder one day, you just would be bouncing a jig on the bottom typically, and as it goes over over the the flounder, he's going to see it come up and grab it. That's typically how he's going to eat. The trout is going to be typically your middle of the water column feeder. He is also going to be death from below to his uh, to his food. You know, he's he's going to come up and usually eat it. Now, a redfish will just he's a garbage can. He's going to eat everything, high, low, middle. It doesn't matter. He, he's typically going to eat it. I mean, I you hear all kind of funny stories about what people use for baits when it comes to. Um, Redfish, you know, they'll, they'll just about eat anything. Um, in our saltwater lagoons, I want to say uh, Carol 
had, I think he's the one that I've heard of the most different species in one lagoon, and I want to say it's 13 or 14 species, I can't remember. Um, different species out of one lagoon in our saltwater lagoons. The strangest thing I've ever caught in one of our lagoons, and it was on this gold spoon, was a Spanish mackerel, which is, <laughs> which is pretty odd. You, don't, you typically don't find them inshore, um, and especially not in an estuary area like a lagoon. So that's, you know, you never know, that's what I love about fishing out of the land, is you, you absolutely never know what you could come up with in our lagoons. And as far as uh, size of fish, uh, biggest flounder I've ever caught in my life, well over 10 pounds was out of a lagoon. Uh, redfish, uh, every bit of the width of a golf cart. I'm trying to remember. I want to say he was 40 plus pounds. Uh, and that was kind of caught close to here. Um, Secret spot. In the mouth, <laughs> caught in the mouth, always. Um, but that was that was caught on like a half a crab back. So I mean, you know, you, you never know what you're gonna what you can catch and what you'll catch them with. I think for me, you fish for a lot of different reasons. If you're fishing for food, I wouldn't suggest doing it in the lagoons. Although they tell us the water is the water clarity or the water pollution level is good. I, I still, if I'm gonna eat something, I'm gonna be out on the uh, open water side. So for me. Fishing out landings is a sport. I enjoy it. I like to be able to release the fish that I catch so I know that I come back next time, at least there's one fish in there that I can catch again. Um, but it's therapy for me as much as anything, just kind of going out there and fishing. And I need to thank you guys because I had an excuse to, that I, a valid excuse that I used yesterday when you know it got to be mid-afternoon. I said, well, you know, if I'm gonna talk about fishing at landings, I better go. And so my wife didn't have any complaints with me going fishing yesterday. And, and I, I took this um, because I wasn't going out to get live bait. It was late in the afternoon, and I, I think Bandy's was already closed. I took this uh, voodoo shrimp, and it's this rig right here, just uh, braid line with a, a, mono, a fluorocarbon leader, just tied to the shrimp, and uh, went out to Lagoon back here on the islands of Deer Creek. I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers, but. Um, that lagoon there, and that's where the big, that big, uh, West, West caught that big uh, redfish, and it was four or five years ago, I think he caught it, but uh, he, had, he often tells me that there, there are huge ones in there, and the point I was trying to make was, for me, it's as much walking around and seeing uh, the fish moving in the lagoons, because I promise you, if you take the time to uh, walk around the lagoon, and you know, just just say you're not fishing with live bait, you're just fishing with artificial, and this rig is as simple as it gets. It's the bait, the rod, and the line. And I, and I walk around that lagoon, and I know there's certain areas, I, it, it takes me forever to get to the side that I actually wanna fish, but it, it paces me, and I, I take my time walking around the lagoon. I get to the area that I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna see this redfish, and he's gonna be sticking his nose up in these rocks. And if you know that, that lagoon in the back, uh, the, the side with the houses, they put some riprap down there, so and it's been there quite a few years now. And the, the fish will come up there and they just they swim along and they stick their nose up in there and they're just looking for a grub or a fiddler crab or a shrimp or a little little bait fish that's up in there. But I tell you, it, it's I walk I walk that lagoon at least every few months, and it, I. I always, I will say virtually 90% of the time, I will see two or three fish work in the bank as I'm going. And I mean, right now is a perfect time because the water clarity is really good. Um, the the turbid, turbidity of the, the lagoons isn't bad, so the, the clarity is pretty good. You can see, I actually watched two fish strike my lure, you know, in a couple of feet of water. So it's, <clears throat> that part of it's fun for me too, to watch them strike it. but. Uh, taking time to walk around the lagoons, you can actually throw to a fish that's out there, which I think is pretty cool. And you can watch him take the bait or be scared by it. Um, I think I scared off the one that I really wanted to catch yesterday, but I got a couple of pictures. I caught a nice bass, a nice trout yesterday, and basically an hour's time, I just, um, I got some exercise walking around the lagoon and got to see four or five fish um, and some osprey and other stuff. So that's, 
that's a, one of the things about being out here that I love so much. And I, and I say this, and you're a new crowd, so you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't have heard it too many times from me. But when I tournament fish on Saturday, you know, we will spend 14 hours on the water. Of that, at least 11 or 12 hours fishing. And I'll take whatever leftover bait we have from Saturday and go out to the lagoons here for an hour and a half and use that bait and catch more, as many if not more fish and better quality fish than I did fishing for 12, 13 hours the day before. The fishing out here is incredible and that's the saltwater side of it. The freshwater side, um, typically when the saltwater side dies off, um, in the springtime the freshwater shoots up and go, just go start fishing the freshwater lagoons for a little while and leave, give the saltwater ones a break. Um, catching bass. I think I actually caught the, one of the largest bass I've ever caught. Um, uh, it would have been in December because my son was here. Um, we were fishing the lagoon off of uh, Sundew and that's another one. It takes me about an hour to walk around it but that gives you a good idea for how you know don't stand in one place and fish especially the lagoons. Uh, work your way around the lagoons because a lot of times we'll find that the, the fish will be in one certain area they're holed up in that one area. Either there's something over there that's hatching or the sun's hitting it in the end of the afternoon and it's a little bit warmer. They're very sensitive to that. So that's usually one of my biggest recommendations is if you're fishing a lagoon, don't just fish in one spot. And don't, unless you see bait moving around and you see fish striking, that's a, another great thing about the freshwater side is when they're after the shad or uh, the bait fish, you can actually watch them and you know, they attack the bait and throw it up on the bank and then you know they're gone for five minutes. Well, you know, in about five minutes they're coming back. So you kind of stay there for that one. But other than that, you know, these big lagoons that we have, any the small ones too, just take your time, work, work in what they say, uh, you know, 10 casts, you know, four or five casts from the bank out to the middle and then skip the middle part typically. Um, and then come back the other way and, and work your way back towards the bank. And typically then you'll find the fish are suspended or they're they're feeding on top or you know you can usually duplicate your efforts pay attention when you catch a fish pay attention to what you're doing and try that you know immediately when you when you release or bring your fish in you know try that again and see if you can mimic your results artificial guys going to jump back in here for just a few minutes i don't have any live bait like he said, when he goes fishing for a while and comes back over, I, I prefer to go artificial the whole time. So he's right. If you can show up with a live bait, fantastic fishing, I mean, on foot, on golf cart, right? Right around here or a small boat right outside of the, the marinas. Uh, two other questions that I've fielded quite a lot from different people talking about fish is, when do you know to use scented or unscented baits on the artificial side? Well, I would tell you this. Any opportunity you have to use a scented bait, use it. It resembles as close as you can to the live baits that Robert described. And there are multiple ways to make or use a scented bait. As simple as going to one of your tackle shops or Dick's Sporting Goods or Walmart or Bass Pro, whatever you want. Berkeley makes a great scented bait and I'm not a promoter of the company by any chance, I just use the bait. This is one version of it. And if you know from those of you who have used scented artificial baits, again, resembling the live bait as much as we can, these pouches stink. For the men in the room, if you go home with this stuff all over your body, your wives are going to kick you out of the house. This stuff is awful. What I do is I'll buy these pouches and then I get one of the containers. And if I had one with me, I'd show it to you. It's about, this, you can buy them about this big in the same place and they have a bunch of baits in them. Well, you can continue to cycle all the different other baits that you use and put them into that scented container, leave them there for a while and use them again. So once you get that container, don't throw it away. I have some that I've used for 10 years and they're still sitting in my garage and I'll still dump my baits in there for a few days before I fish with them. So a uh, neat little key there. Next question I get is water color. What do we do with baits? Well, much like a chameleon, the chameleon's on the, on the grass, he's gonna turn green, he's on your fence, he's gonna turn as brown as he can. The bait fish and even the shrimp will do the same thing. If you see water quality that's really clear, like Robert described right now through the winter time, it's difficult to fish a dark bait and get positive reaction to it all the time. 
you're trying to limit the amount of loss that you have when you're fishing. You fish a dark bait in clear water, there's a lot of loss. The fish are skittish from it, they'll, end to, they'll tend to turn away from it, they don't notice it, they know something is up because when the water is clean and clear, the baits will look a lot like the bottom of this one right here. Even though it's a hard bait, it's not something I typically would fish in clear water, they'll look a different color. You, you've noticed them too if you throw a cast net or you pick up shrimp that are in white sand versus dark mud, they have a different color. So do your best to pick up an artificial bait that resembles the fish that you see in the water from a size perspective, but certainly from a color perspective. Uh, I know we want to get you all out of here because I guess there's a football game on today. So on. But we do want to leave uh, as much time as we can for, for questions and answers. But I have one other thing. Somebody asked me as they were walking in, in here tonight, what is the go-to bait if you had to throw it from an artificial standpoint all the time? And I was digging through my tackle box, y'all may have seen me a few minutes ago, I was putting it together, and then I realized like an idiot. It's on the other one of my fishing rods, because it really is my go-to bait. Really difficult to beat a small lead head with this color, a chartreuse curly tail bait. It's soft, it's small, it resembles a shrimp or a bait fish or a crab or whatever the heck it is that climbs out of the mud. The color, for some reason for me, seems to get the most strikes. If I had a go-to bait, this would be it right here. It'd probably cost a whopping 97 cents to put together at Walmart if you wanted to put them together. You're welcome to come up and take a look at them. So I guess with that, we'll open it up, Robert. Fire away. I've never fished shrimp before. I'm from, from the north. <laughs> Do you jig it? Wait, 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 cast it out and just... <clears throat> Like the chicken. question was um, fishing shrimp. A lot. Of, I presume, are you talking about a live bait or are you talking about a dead bait? That or live bait. Eh? Live bait. Uh, typically, you want to try and hook the bait so that you have as much movement from the bait. So don't kill it. Um, typically, if I'm fishing it under a cork, I'm going to fish. The, I'm going to bait thread the hook through the bait. Um, a, a, our common white shrimp or brown shrimp have have you know, their brain stem and, and another dot. So typically what you'll see is the hook goes kind of right between them and the base of their horn is right there. So there, there's something substantial for them for it to hold on to. Um, so you can go right through there or you can lace it from, from, the, uh, from the back of the head up through so that the hook comes out next to the horn. So it's just too hard, you know, it's the horn and the hook are sitting right there. And that would be how I would fish a live shrimp underneath the cork or just freelining it um, on a either a circle hook or a kale hook, uh, depending on what we're doing. More, I think you and I were fishing uh, with, for the tarpon that time in one of the lagoons, and you made a statement, made me laugh. I looked over at more and he didn't catch my eye, but um, so once in a while, if I've got a whole bunch of bait, a whole bunch of shrimp, I'll take it out, I'll, I'll throw a few of them out there and, and just uh, just to see what they do. And I think one day Mort and I were fishing over off of uh, Long Island Road and one shrimp, you'll get one that does it, they, they all don't do this obviously, but this one shrimp just, he just got excited. He just started popping across the top of the lagoon and I bet he went 25 yards like that. And about a seven, eight pound tarpon just came up underneath and killed it. So it's just, you know, for me, I'll do that every once in a while just to see if, uh, hey, let's see what's going on here, if I can get some, some bait to go like that. So if I'm fishing a live bait underneath the cork, I'll thread the hook so that I don't kill the shrimp, hopefully, and I can cast it a few times. And uh, typically what he's gonna do is he's gonna, he's gonna pop, and that's what, that's what that, that sound mimics. Um, and that's the, you know, so as he starts to die, you can use the popping, Cork to mimic that sound to keep the draw the interest there. Um, if you're going to fish one underneath a jig head, say you got some dead bait, um, typically not going to find a trout that way, but you will get a, a flounder and a redfish. A redfish more than anything. Um, typically they, they'll thread it through the tail so the, the, the shrimp is sitting like this and the hook's back here and you just pitch it out and some people will just leave, you know, they'll take a, a mullet, cut it in pieces and just leave it on the bottom. And as he's coming around, he's gonna find it eventually. That's what happens in the lagoons. They're just swimming in circles, I think, most of the time. 
So eventually he's going to find that, pick it up, and go. But if you're going to jig it, you know, you just underneath the tail, um, so the hook's coming back out the other way. Typically, they're going to eat it head first and uh, take it that way. But you just uh, that way you can just flip it along. And even though it's not alive anymore, it it has that that motion. And that's what this shrimp does. They they've got the they've got the head weighted and then the the tail ribbed. So when it's in the water, that tail actually sits up like that and moves a little bit in the current. Um, and that's all this one is designed to do is you can, you can fish it along so it's swimming along top, let it drop, and it's gonna drop like this. The tail's gonna be bouncing a little bit as it moves. And that's all you're looking for on the, on the shrimp. If you were gonna fish a mullet or a mud minnow, either um, through the eyes or up through the lip, and that, they, they won't kill them. Um, they'll, you know, if you do it through the eyes, they won't, he won't be able to see what's going to eat him, so that's not very nice. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. What, is it, what are the rules of the etiquette uh, for fishing in people's backyards? Um, I've had good things and bad things. The Landings Association um, typically owns a, a, about 8 to 10 feet from the high water mark around the lagoons that the Landings Association is in charge of. That does not include lagoons that are on the golf course, because the golf course owns those. It's a totally different game there, uh, totally different game if golfers are present, you know, you're, you're really wearing out your welcome really quickly. I try to, uh, I try to always be respectful of whoever's property I'm close to when I'm fishing. If I see some trash, I'll pick it up. Um, look in people's windows, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the fish, so I th most people will come out, especially if you catch something, they're, they're curious, um, they'll come out and ask you questions, but I, I think for most parts, um, you, you, have a, you have certain rights within eight to ten feet of the high water mark, so the bank typically of the water, um, I wouldn't go trampsing through somebody's, you know, 20 yards up somebody's yard. Uh, but I, I really haven't had anybody say anything to I think I've had one person say something to me. That's about it. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> what flies would you use for fly fishing? And where would you fly fish? I, I can answer that in a couple different ways. As far as where to fly fish, yeah. exactly the same places that we're fishing on the bottom because you can have a sinking fly, right? Or sometimes the fish will be feeding on the surface. So the same places that you would fish for live bait or artificial bait inside the lagoons, that, as long as you can obviously get the fly casting, there's so much vegetation, there's some areas that you're pretty restricted in. Uh, as far as flies, the flies that I've used and caught fish in the landings, they're rolling in one tight, all poppers. I, I see people fishing some subsurface flies where they're stripping them pretty quick. The only fish I've caught poppers all different sizes little poppers catching bluegill and uh, some bigger bigger large baits about this size for the big bass everything's on the surface for me your back cast is probably going to be your biggest hindrance yeah. on that you know just if you can if you can make your cast any of the lagoons that that we fish would be perfect for it and i'd say you know and you probably agree with me if you have confidence in a bait i don't yeah. know what it is you catch a lot more yeah. fish but um, I think most of the baits are designed to catch us, yeah. and then just we get comfortable with them, and, and you know we can make a presentation that works. So. Yeah, the poppers look pretty. Probably that's why I'm fishing. They, they look good. You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Is that uh, saltwater rig like you have there for the popper, but it has an artificial shrimp that's suspended from it? Is that it? Is that rig any good? Yeah, I'll jump all over it. All day long. Absolutely. On Sunday. Yeah. Both of us got on it. Absolutely. That clicking noise is a fish attractant, right? Just like this bait is. And anything that's hanging below in a strike zone that's moving, when they're aggressive, yeah, absolutely they're going to eat it. With all of our guides in the area, I mean, shrimp aren't readily available all the time, and they have to fish 365 days a year. That is probably what they fish more than anything. Uh, even over live bait, they'll fish uh, a DOA shrimp underneath a popping cork. The, I think if you get, if you pulled 10 of them, 
every one of them say they do that, and half of more than half of them tell you they do that the majority of the time. The, the other thing I would add to it is if you're fishing an artificial bait, a shrimp specifically underneath a cork, the durability is much more improved. So you could drag that bait real fast, you could twitch it, you can move it on a live shrimp, you kill the bait pretty fast, right? So with that, you cover some territory. And for me, that's the artificial side too, the covered territory. You got a cure for hitchhikers when you're using the page of thunder? Well, I, I was gonna, I was gonna, I, I did grab one out of my, my, uh, my garage this evening as I came up here, because that was the thing I was gonna tell you is, there are a couple of different styles of these. Uh, the Cajun Thunder is available pretty much everywhere. This product is made here in Savannah. It's called Burnside Bobber. The guys that make it are actually over on Burnside Island. And you'll probably buy 30 or 40 of these to one of these the way they're made. The hitchhikers typically are in your cast or the, uh, the length of the leader can sometimes cause it. Uh, but these, you can see, this one doesn't doesn't really move anymore because the wire the wire bends so easy on these ones. The, the Cajun Thunder, the uh, electric, not the electric chicken, it's the uh, Thunder, chicken. Thunder Chicken, the Billy Bob Bates, all of them, the, the, they're just made as cheaply as possible. You know, for a couple of dollars more, you get this these ones, and these things will last you until you lose them. That's, that's the biggest difference in these. The sound in these is better too. But um, What's the size of the sinker on that? On this one it is a quarter ounce, I think. It's a small one. But the, uh, the hitchhiker is, is typically, uh, when, you're, when you're releasing it, it the, bait gets, the bait gets dragged behind and the cork gets in front of it. And it typically happens when you're throwing in the wind, I would guess, for, that's when I see it happen. And so what happens is, uh, for me, sometimes that, that uh, uh, fluoro gets, gets wrapped and it, and it has a little bit of memory, Some, especially if you use mono. Mono's the worst because it does get some memory to it. And once it gets that wrapped memory, it has a tendency to do it more often. So you can trim up your, your leader and see if that helps. So a question back here. Uh, Robert, this question might really be more to Vic, but uh, when we're catching a lot of crappie, um, you know, and, and probably just as many crappie as bass. You know, there's one pound, one and a half pound, two pound, which is kind of nice, uh, not as much fun as a bass. But um, I'm just wondering what's, what CCA, you know, what our stance is on crappie, what do you want to do with them? Um, and I don't know, sort of. Well, there's a, a, a philosophy, philosophy behind why crappie take over. And essentially, they will spawn earlier and start eating other spawn before they have a chance to hatch. So they typically, from a, a pond management side standpoint, they don't want you to stop cropping in anything less than a five acre lagoon because they can so quickly outpace the, uh, the other fish. And I guess my fish man right over there probably talked more about that than any of us. I don't think there, there isn't a, uh, a plan as far as moving. Crappie tastes good, so maybe that's, that's something that helps us. Right. Yes, sir. When you're spinning it, what's the line weight and leader that you could suggest? Uh, inside the lagoons, yeah. as light as possible. Yeah. And quite frankly, from my perspective, number one, they're easier to fish a light bait, and I like a light small bait. I'm not typically a big bait guy, so light line, light bait. Uh, secondarily is, I don't really care if I lose a fish, so I would just assume fish light line as a challenge, as you probably are all catching from this conversation, I, I like the challenge with it, so I fish as light as possible. If I fish a braided line, and I brought some with me tonight, some Power Pro, I'll fish 15 pound Power Pro, which is the diameter, I think it's four or six pound mono, something like that. So is that what you say you got in your tackle? I got some of it in there. No, you don't. It's 20. Is it 20? Okay, so it's close enough. Uh, if I fish mono, it's 8 or a 10 pound line at the heaviest. Something really light. I always, uh, whether on my big rods, uh, I'll fish 50 pound braid. 
and just go down. You know, my leader is where my break point is, so I, I don't want to lose my rig. So my leader is always the the circumference or the diameter of the braid is so small. I think 50 pound braid is 12 to 10 pound mono diameter. So I don't I don't really have a problem with that, and and it lasts for so long. On my big rides, sometimes when I'm fishing out in the the creeks and stuff, you know, I can I can set it back 75 yards sometimes, you know, if I'm fishing long down a long bank with a good drift. So I, I like to have a little bit more weight on my braid, but my my fluorocarbon or my mono leader is always gonna be less than 20 pounds or less. Yeah, I'll add something to Robert's comment about durability. For recreational fishermen, like most of us are, and Roger would obviously disagree with this, but I've had this line on my Stratic for, you know, I'll have it on there for sometimes, I know this sounds funny, 10 years for recreational fishermen. So you could go through a mono and because it gets old and crusty on your reels, if you fish a braided line, I mean, it can last as long as you want to fish it, really. To me, it does. It's a nice tiny little fish. Yeah. So Robert, do you mark your line as far as the, the braid? I don't. I, I on my on my big rods. I have the yellow, and actually, I bought this rig at River Services right before Christmas because I needed something else to play with. <laughs> it's white, so I don't. I don't. You know, there there are theories behind the the red line going out. The red um, line on on car. I mean on gray. Yeah. I to me, I don't. I usually fish enough of a leader that I'm I'm not right there by the. By the bait. What does it mean, red line? Uh, the the UV um, in the water. They say that the red line becomes invisible. Oh, okay. That okay. That red line. I thought you were marking the distance. You were. Uh, really no, no, no you were talking about the actual color of the line, Alan. Right. Yeah. As far as visibility goes. Okay. Yeah. The challenge guy doesn't care what color his line is. Just throwing that. <laughs> <laughs> challenge. That's right. Yes, sir. You said uh, y'all are fishing for tarpon. Uh, what artificial baits or even the live bait would y'all use for that? The tarpon, um, I've, I've caught them on shrimp and finger mullet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be honest with you, it's been probably two years since I've caught one or focused on trying to catch one. There are certain lagoons where if they're if they're here, they're in these certain lagoons like um, out Little Comfort Way. I think there's a couple of lagoons out there, but typically it's uh, is shrimp is mm -hmm. what I've caught them on. And I caught them on the first one I ever caught was underneath a popping cork, and I turned around and caught a snook at the same time. So they, I mean, they're obvious. Now uh, a mutual friend of ours that used to live here was fishing in February, caught a tarpon in a snook. So. There, the theory was that they, they'd always leave, but I think they were living in, I think they, in the wintertime when the water gets really cold, they'll go into the culverts, because underneath the roads, I think that, you know, they're not, water temperature may get down in the 50s, but probably not much lower than that. So, I, for that, I'd say live bait, but I, I think I've heard of people catching them on artificials, especially, you know, like the, uh, the uh, she dogs and mirror lures and stuff like that. And for me, it's a seasonal thing, too. The tarpon are more aggressive, obviously, when it's warm. And when it's warm, the finger mullet are in. And when the finger mullet are in, they're eating them on the top of the water. And so I fish a top water bait. I don't catch a lot of tarpon on artificial. Uh, in Florida, much more so than here. And maybe it's quantities or it's just the way they feed. But it's seasonal, really, for me. All right. minutes to pick off pretty good then the, the only thing I'm going to close with is um, and I always forget to say this I always say well next time I talk I'll say it um, whenever I whenever I land a fish in a lagoon and I don't, I'm not really talking about fishing in the boat but in the lagoons I always take time to make sure I bring the fish up on the bank and away from the uh, edge of the water I see some people trying to just not take them out of the water and I can understand from a conservation standpoint why they would do that but in the uh, warmer months, 
I just have had too many experiences with alligators. So now I always bring my fish up on the bank a few feet, and I figure if, if that way it gives me a couple of extra heartbeats to get out of his <laughs> Yes, I'd like you to stay up here so we can give you guys a round of applause. Uh, and the other reason I'd like you, not, not to blind you, but so that you can pick the winner of today's raffle. And while, while we're getting ready to do that, I'd like two announcements to make. I, I said it earlier, but I've been told that I did not say it. But I'm, so I'm not going to argue with anyone. But on Friday, January 29th, there is a fish fry. The fish fry will be at the Delegal, uh, the house down there. And in the back of the room, we have tickets being sold by Pat Brooks and Chuck, Kett, uh, Chuck, Kessie, Chuck Smith. The tickets are $20 each and uh, it's going to a great cause. Also, at the fish fry, uh, we, we announced the Volunteer of the, of the Year award. So if you haven't ever been to one, you're missing a heck of a, heck of a food fit. Uh, yeah, food fight, I was going to say. Okay, heck of a feast. And so, join us, please. Also, uh, to point it out, our annual banquet is scheduled, currently scheduled for April 7th. So put that in your, uh, put, save that date, and uh, if you'd like to volunteer, we can surely use some help. So uh, if you're interested in volunteering and helping out with the annual banquet, please see Tom Rude. Okay. So, yeah, let's have a draw. Let's have a draw. Have you picked it already? He dropped it. Yeah, just goes drawn. Right. Okay. Let's see if it's this one. And there was a gentleman who left early. He gave me his tickets. So, uh, 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 5.07. That's me. Starting with. Oh. <laughs> then we're in the 4,000. Everybody's still in it. I, I presume everybody's still in it. Yes. 600. All still good? Mm -hmm. Everybody. We're going to move to the 60s, and we're going to stop right there at 60. So, what's that number again? 660. 4660, last four. 4660. Going once. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Nobody else, nobody left. Really? 507 4660. Zero. All right. You gonna say going once? Going, going once. once. <laughs> going twice. Next number, please. Five oh seven. Forty five. Four zero. Hello, anybody? You <laughs> sold a ton of tickets. Oh, there we go. There we go. Just a little slow on the. All I want to say is roll tide. Yeah. Roll tide. Good luck, buddy. Okay. Well, just just to close up the meeting, yep. I'd like to remind you. That's your winner. I'd like to remind you of the program next month. Uh, this is a program that we've had previously uh, in years past. We asked Sean Burgess, who's environmental manager for the landings, to come in and talk to us about what's going on and what they see. It, it's going to be a very interesting uh, discussion, not only talking about the challenges and opportunities we see in the fisheries, but also some of the various programs that, that we have working here. So, please join us. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you.